I'm here with Alexander Merkurs, editor-in-chief of the Duran. Alexander, let's talk about the Russian economy. We have some news coming out of Russia uh, related to the economy, related to interest rates, uh, related to inflation. What's the latest update on the Russian economy? It's not uh, as uh, dreary and as and as bad as the Western mainstream media makes it. It's actually quite the reverse, correct, Alexander? Absolutely. In fact, it's actually very enlightening to read about the Russian economy from, you know, look at look at its uh, uh, look at the statistics that are coming out of Russia and comparing them what, with what's actually happening in the West. As we all know, in the West at the moment, we have this huge problem of um, unconstrained debt creation, uh, creation. There's worries about negative interest rates everywhere. Negative interest rates are these situations where uh, lenders are actually paying people to borrow money from them, which is crazy and is creating this upside down world and is eliminating savings. And um, at the same time, everybody's talking around the world about the world, or at least the West, the Western part of the world, now slipping into recession again. G Germany um, is already is already G there, correct? Germany is already there. There's worries about Britain, where we now see the economy is contracting. There's always worries about France. There's worries about Italy, and even the the mighty United States. Things are getting more and more wobbly there with Donald Trump at war with the Federal Reserve. Anyway, we then go to Russia. And we find ourselves in a completely different economic world. Now, uh, firstly, I, I should say that one reads an awful lot about the Russian economy in the international media, the Western media. And most of it, I, I'm sorry to say, you can just completely ignore because it is nonsense. I mean, it is it is completely distorted information. First thing to say is that um, we are actually seeing steady rises in output. Now, industrial expansion this year has been actually quite fast in Russia, it's averaged around two to three percent a month. Um, agricultural pr production in Russia is booming. Um, it's quite likely they're going to have a record harvest for this year. Their budget is in very healthy surplus. It's around two to three percent of GDP. Most other countries, it's in deficit. In the United States, it's in very heavy deficit. And, of course, Russia now always runs a uh, large surplus on its current account and its balance of payments. So Russia is actually building up its financial reserves. They now stand at $530 billion, more than they stood at the time when the sanctions were imposed in 2014. And at the same time, and this has been the government's priority, inflation, which has been this huge problem in Russia, going all the way back to the Soviet period in the 1960s, uh, right back to the 1960s, Russia, which throughout the post-Soviet years, had double-digit Inflation is now falling like a stone. It was expected to hit 4.3% this year. It's probably going to be around 3%, might even fall a bit lower. So it's almost converged with the levels of the Western world. So overall, when you look at the macroeconomic picture, it's pretty strong and stable, very different from what people say. Now, there are some problems in order to get inflation down from, you know, this very high historic level. The Russian central bank has kept interest rates very high. Those who follow my commentary about the Russian economy will know that I have been arguing for, for several years now that the central bank has been keeping interest rates too high. It's the exact opposite of the problem we have in the West. In the West, interest rates are negative. Lenders are paying or borrowers to borrow money from them. In Russia, interest rates are positive so that borrowers pay lenders interest as they are supposed to do. That means 
that there is an incentive in Russia to save, which does not exist in the West. And that's why we're seeing the budget in surplus, the reserves growing, the banks in Russia increasingly healthy, and savings generally across the economy growing. But it has keeping interest rates as high as they've been in Russia, and they're around between 5 and 7% real interest rates for the last five years, that does depress demand, and it does re re result in slower overall economic growth. So what we see is that the productive sides of the economy, manufacturing, agriculture, are getting stronger, but consumption, what people buy in buying in the shops and in services and all, in all, all that side of it, that's been growing more slowly, which has depressed the GDP figures. It's made the GDP figures rise less fast than they might otherwise have done. But overall, it's an economy that's not only very stable, but it's an economy where the productive part of the economy is growing and expanding, and which, because it's now got all of these reserves, got all of these savings, isn't borrowing from the West anymore. Russia has the lowest debt profile of any debt of any developed country. I mean, the you know, Russian government is a net creditor, not a net borrower. Um, it means that if there is a general crisis, in the world economy, as many believe, or if there's even a recession in the world economy, as most people believe, then Russia itself should be largely immune. What, what is preventing um, Russia from fixing the, the interest rates, from decreasing the interest rates? What's, what's the reasoning behind keeping them at, those, at that level for five years? You mentioned five yes. years, I believe, correct? Yeah, no, no. Well, indeed, five years. I mean, it, Russia has had very high, I mean, in my opinion, excessively high. It, it's right. completely the opposite as to what's well, it's, going it's, on in in Europe and the United States. Why why aren't it, it, they lowering it? Yes, I think right. There's there's basically two reasons for this. First, well, three reasons. Firstly, they have had this very long history of very high inflation. Now we all know about, or at least those people who follow Russia know about the very high inflation Russia suffered in the 1990s. I mean, it peaked. In 1992, at 2,500%. That's the extent to which prices rose in 1992. But in reality, Russia has had double digit inflation growth every year from 1991 until 2011. So 20 years of very, very high inflation. If you're going to get inflation that is so entrenched, in the economy down, not just the single figures, but you know, really crank it down to developed country levels, you need a very long period of high interest rates. That's one reason. The second is, um, I think that the central bank of Russia um, wants high interest rates because it is very nervous um, that if interest rates go down, too quickly, um, too many people in Russia are going to start going on a borrowing spree. And it has a very, very strong aversion to seeing debt levels within Russia rise. This is, again, the opposite of the West, where people want to see you know, debt increasing. Russians have a general aversion to debt because they remember what happened with debt when they had very high debt in the 1990s. And I think the third reason is because Russia has relatively low debt levels, it means that the central bank can keep interest rates very high without risking a recession. So we actually see an economy that's able to grow with high interest rates. And I think that has encouraged the Russian central bank to keep interest rates higher for longer than I personally think was wise.
Alexander, how do you explain the argument that um, there's two Russias, two economic Russias? There's Moscow, St. Petersburg, and, and the big the big city hubs, specifically Moscow and St. Petersburg. Yes. And yes. then there's there are the other cities, the second tier, and the third tier cities, where they say the quality yeah. of life is drastically different. Yeah. Do you subscribe to to that thinking that there really are two different economic Russias? No, and I if don't. So, and if so, mm -hmm. and if there is discrepancy, which I think there, I'm, I know there is. Yeah. What does what does the Russian government have to do? Because you're talking about yeah. a very very large country. Absolutely. <laughs> very vast. <laughs> What do they have to do in order to to raise those other second and third tier cities to to, to a higher level? And I say yes. that because you know you have in Vladivostok this uh, these these days you have the Eastern Economic Forum, yeah. which does take into account and focuses on the Far East of Indeed. Russia. Yeah, I mean these are all excellent questions. First of all, can I just deal with this question of the first and second tier and third tier cities? I mean, obviously Moscow is far and away the richest city in Russia, and it's got the highest standard of living. It is not unusual in, a, in most countries for the capital city to be a particularly rich city. So that's not untypical. Russia's not untypical in that respect. And as you rightly say, Russia is an enormous country. It's the world's biggest country. So it is inevitable in a country of that side that there will be richer reasons and regions and poorer regions. There are richer and poorer regions in the United States. But I, much of what I read about, you know, the much greater poverty of second tier and third tier cities um, is, in my opinion, out of date. I mean, my own experience and those of people I know who travel around Russia tell me that second tier cities now have become very much richer um, over the last 10 years, and that essentially, even if they haven't fully uh, caught up with Moscow levels, in fact, I mean, it's inconceivable that they ever would, because Moscow is always going to be a different place. Nonetheless, they are now actually quite prosperous places. Third tier cities still have some way to go. If you really want to find poverty in Russia, you're not going to find it in the cities. You're going to find it in some of the villages and in some of the small towns. But what are they going to do to change all of this? Well, the thing that the Russian government has been talking about, and in fact, not just talking about, they're, they're actually going to start implementing it from the second half of this year, uh, is that they have huge projects. They've increased taxes to fund them. I, I've mentioned that the Russian government always runs a budget surplus. So it saves to spend. It doesn't borrow to spend in the way that governments do in the West. It is now going to use these huge savings it has accumulated to undertake a gigantic infrastructure program to improve Russia's uh, um, airports, its roads, its rail links, to establish a major problem that you find in Russia is um, that communications between cities are not, it's not always easy. So, that, you know, if you want to fly from, say, Vladivostok in the Far East to Novosibirsk, which is a town in Siberia, what you sometimes find you have to do is you have to fly from Vladivostok to Moscow, which is walking right at the far end of Russia, and then fly from Moscow to Novosibirsk, because Moscow acts as this hub. What the Russian government now wants to do is it wants to establish regional airlines which will interconnect these cities, regional transport service, railways, other kind of links that will enable all of these various places to interlink with each other and not have to go through Moscow all the time. And at the same time, the Russian government is going to invest very heavily in science and technology, they have a major AI program. They're going to invest very heavily in education. There's going to be apparently a huge increase in spending on education at, at all levels, but you know, especially higher education. And they're also going to uh, invest heavily in healthcare because there is a 
conviction that healthcare is a sector that is needed to provide for a healthier population. So the Russian government has this program of national projects, as it is called, and it is expected to raise GDP, um, the rate of growth of GDP significantly starting from the end of this year, and in the end to resolve many of these structural and geographical problems that the Russian government um, is concerned about, and which many people, both in Russia and outside, often talk about. All right. And finally, the last question, Alexander, the myth of sanctions, U.S. Mm -hmm. and EU sanctions. Do you believe that the sanctions really did help Russia? And yes. Do you I believe think it... that Russia, the myth that Russia does not want the sanctions removed? In other words, they want to keep the sanctions in place because there's this theory that it's helping them out. These sanctions are yeah. helping them out. Do you believe in that? Do yeah. you subscribe to that? Well, I, I'll tell you what I think about this. I think that in 2014, when the sanctions were imposed, the sanctions were a real problem because Russian corporates, Russian companies and banks tended to borrow very heavily from the West in order to finance their investment programs. And when they found that they couldn't do that any longer, investment fell and that undoubtedly intensified the recession that was happening in Russia, um, would have happened in Russia at that time anyway, because of the oil price fall. But I think what has now happened is that Russian banks and corporates have paid off nearly all their debt to the West, to Western banks. And um, the Russian banking system has itself got much stronger over the last five years. And I think that Russia can now, to a great extent, finance the growth of its own economy, especially since savings have been growing. I mean, this is one of the reasons I spoke about the high interest rates. The high interest rates are intended partly to reduce inflation. They're also partly intended to encourage saving. In the West, we don't encourage saving. We have negative interest rates. So it's not actually a good idea to save. In Russia, it is. And that's going to make a difference. The other thing that the sanctions have done is that, of course, they've encouraged the Russians to develop more actively the productive sides of their economy. So. There's been a major import substitution program in industry, which is now starting visibly to bear fruit with uh, Russian products like, say, gas turbines, machine tools, aircraft, aircraft engines, all beginning to come on stream. And of course, in agriculture, um, it's been straightforward protectionism and it's paid huge dividends. There's been a big surge in Russian agricultural growth. So I think the sanctions were a problem, a very real problem in 2014, 2015. I don't think that they are much of a problem anymore. I think the economy has successfully adapted to the sanctions. And overall, I think that they have been a net gain. Now, what... They, what effect they will have going forward is another matter. I personally think that we've now reached the point in, with the Russian economy where the sanctions don't matter very much. They don't actually hold the economy back and lifting them isn't going to make much difference. All right, Alexander Mercurius, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Thank you very much. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below. Click on the notifications bell to make sure you get notifications every time we push out a new video. And make sure to follow us on iTunes and SoundCloud so you can get an audio copy of this video. The links are in the description box down below. And please donate to the Duran, PayPal, Patreon, and subscribe star. You will find the links also in the description box down below. And your donation helps keep this channel up and running, helps keep us moving forward. And something else that helps keep us keeps us moving forward is when you purchase some really cool swag. We've got a lot of cool swag. We've got, We've magic, things. <laughs> we've got magic mugs, which when you drink from them will increase your geopolitical yeah. quotient, your GQ, not your IQ, your GQ. By hundreds of points. Oh, absolutely. No question. And when you wear our shirts, well, 
Well, they you imbue know. you with confidence. You feel <laughs> exactly. You feel you feel like you know a lord, if I may say, because you look so smart and you feel so confident. Yeah, P- Putin's got nothing on you when you wear no, some, of, some of the Durand no, merchandise. Absolutely, absolutely not. You look incredibly smart and elegant. And why? And and so you should, because it's beautiful merchandise. I mean, this is a, a, a lovely shirt that I'm wearing now, 100% cotton, beautifully dyed, beautifully stitched. Beautifully cut. I mean, it really looks smart. I mean, my wife loves seeing me in Durand's shirts. And my wife is a very exacting person. She does care very much what sort of things I wear and what I wear when I meet people. So, you see, if she approves them, it shows that they must be good. And so we have shirts like the one I'm wearing now. We've got polo shirts. We've got hoodies. We've got T-shirts. We've got hats really great hats, stickers, lots of marvellous things. And as Alex said, we have these these phenomenal, wonderful Duran mugs. These are my two original Duran mugs, which I'm particularly fond of for that reason. This one has uh, the Duran double-headed eagle on it, pointing to the east and the west. This is Moscow's double-headed eagle. We had we just had done a video on Russia, so it's appropriate to refer to it with the Russian double-headed eagle and St. George, who is the saint of Moscow, slaying the dragon of fake news and untruth, and no doubt, as the Russian Central Bank would say, of inflation also. So uh, there we are. They are phenomenal things. And we don't just sell uh, merchandise. We also sell books. We've got two great books on Russiagate. We've got a uh, great book on Brexit, though I suspect we're going to have to update it very soon because so much is going on on that front. Um, if you want to help the Duran, go to our shop, buy these wonderful things. You'll be helping yourself by doing it. You'll in- enlarge your mind by drinking with cups like this. You'll enlarge your confidence by wearing shirts like this. You'll learn huge amounts by reading our books. Alex will tell you how to do it. You will find a link in the description box down below. Alexander Mercurius, thank you very much. Until next time, everybody, take care.